Hello everyone, my name is Rick Bell. I'm a professor of early American history at the University of Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. in the United States. I'm the author of a new book, Stolen, Five Free Boys, Kidnapped into Slavery, and Their Astonishing Odyssey Home. Uh, I've got the great pleasure and opportunity to talk about this book uh, today with you, and I'm so grateful for Octopus, book, for the Octopus Books for the chance to connect uh, with this group of uh, readers and community members. My plan for today is simple. I'm going to talk for about, ooh, what, 30 minutes about the book's characters, uh, themes, and uh, takeaways, uh, and then I'm going to respond to a couple of the questions that staff members at Octopus uh, Books uh, sent me, which might give us a chance to connect this um, true story from the 1820s uh, to the world we live in now. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Cornelius Sinclair was 10 years old, and he was trapped. He was locked, he was stuck in the belly of a small ship that was bobbing in the middle of the Delaware River, about a mile south of Philadelphia. A man had grabbed Cornelius from a spot near Philadelphia's market about an hour ago, tossed him into a wagon, shoved a black gag into his mouth, and hauled him here. It was dark below the waterline, but Cornelius could see enough to know that he was not alone. Down here, four other pairs of eyes stared back at him, four other black boys. One looked about his size, was probably 10 or 11 years old, like Cornelius. Two more were taller, perhaps 14 or 15. The last of them were shorter and smaller than the rest. He might have been as young as eight years old. Yesterday, all five boys had been free, like you and me. But now, suddenly... They were slaves, prisoners of a gang of child snatchers who planned to sell their lives and their labors, most likely to plantation owners in the Deep South. If their abductors got away with this, Cornelius would spend the rest of his life as someone else's property, somewhere very far away. He would never see, probably, his friends or family again. Cornelius disappeared in late August of 1825 one of dozens of African-American children to vanish in very similar circumstances from Philadelphia that single year alone. In the early 19th century, this city of Philadelphia was the hub of American slavery's blackest market. Its gridded streets and its tangled alleys were hunting grounds for crews of professional kidnappers who made their livings turning free black kids like Cornelius into southern slaves. They did this work swiftly and shamelessly, in brazen affront to Philadelphia's reputation at the time as the city of brotherly love, as a safe haven for people of color, uh, and as the headquarters of the American anti-slavery movement at the time. But of course, to kidnappers, to traffickers, to criminals, none of that stuff mattered one bit, and in truth, Early 19th century Philadelphia was probably one of the most dangerous places to be free and black anywhere in the United States. And this was a product of its location. It was the nearest free city to the slave states. Philadelphia was just, what, 40 miles north of the Mason-Dixon line, the boundary that separated Pennsylvania from several slave states. And as Pennsylvania and other northern states had slowly disentangled themselves from race slavery in the 50 or so years after the American Revolution, that boundary had become ever more important, especially for black people. By 1825, the year that Cornelius was kidnapped, that Mason-Dixon line seemed to divide two worlds, separating northern free states from southern slave states. For African Americans, it was the closest thing to a meaningful modern international border anywhere in North America. And Philadelphia's proximity to that frontier line made its many free black residents attractive targets for professional people snatchers. They preyed on the members of the city's black community relentlessly, putting bullseyes on their backs, putting prices on their heads. The people they stole away could fetch anywhere up to $15,000 per person in today's money in Louisiana, in Mississippi, 
in Alabama, three of the new territories and states that were rising up along the Gulf Coast at exactly this period. The American settlers swarming into that region demanded, needed, they claimed, a nearly bottomless supply of forced labor to cut sugarcane and pick cotton. They would take almost anyone to do that backbreaking work, including, it seems, children as young as 10-year-old Cornelius Sinclair. Buying some of their enslaved laborers from kidnappers was not likely their first choice, but would-be slave owners' options were limited. Planters down there in the Deep South had been forced to look to domestic sources for their manpower needs ever since the year 1808, the year that lawmakers in Washington, D.C. had passed legislation outlawing any further imports of enslaved people from Africa and the Caribbean. That 1808 decision was a major turning point in the history of slavery in America, one that spurred the growth of a domestic slave trade or internal slave trade within the existing United States. After that 1808 decision, interstate slave traders in the United States tried to satisfy these southwestern settlers' demands for black labor by bringing them thousands of American born slaves each year from existing slave states like Maryland and Virginia. But settlers down in the Deep South wanted even more. The more they were willing to pay, the more tempting and profitable it became for anyone sufficiently cold-blooded to try to kidnap free children like Cornelius from northern cities like Philadelphia, smuggle them into the legal supply chain, and sell them in this vast new southwestern slave market. These economic incentives left Philadelphia's large and dynamic free black population dangerously exposed. By 1825, the city of brotherly love had become the center of an interregional kidnapping operation. It had become the northern terminus of something that we might usefully call the reverse underground railroad. So when I say those words, reverse underground railroad, I'm talking to the wholly illegal kidnapping of free black Americans and selling them into southern slavery. And this reverse underground railroad and its much better known namesake, the Underground Railroad, they of course ran in opposite directions, right? And they of course existed for wholly opposite purposes, right? But in many ways, they are actually mirror images of one another. On the Underground Railroad, that's the good one, the famous one, the Harriet Tubman one, enslaved people would abandon southern plantations and trek northward, dreaming of new lives and new opportunities in freedom. On what I call the reverse Underground Railroad, free black people would vanish from northern towns and cities like Philadelphia and would be made to trudge southward to be sold into plantation slavery. On the Underground Railroad, conductors like Harriet Tubman risked their lives and their own liberty to help black fugitives make these epic journeys of freedom. On what I call the reverse Underground Railroad, the conductors were kidnappers and human traffickers motivated by money. Both of these networks roared to life in the early 19th century to exploit what by then had become major differences in the legal status of slavery in the northern states versus the southern states. Both networks were loosely organized, highly opportunistic. Both ran on secrecy and relied on small circles of trusted participants on forged documents, on false identities, on disguise. Whether traveling from the slave states into the free states or vice versa, black voyagers had to hide in stables, barns, and attics. The direction of travel was different, but the routes taken by freedom seekers and by victims of kidnapping like Cornelius Sinclair were largely the same. They might even have passed one another on the roads from time to time. And what's more, the volume of traffic on these two railroads was roughly the same size. 
Each and every year in the early 19th century, hundreds of black adults and children, maybe thousands, uh, risked everything to escape slavery on the Underground Railroad. And each and every year in the first half of the 19th century, hundreds if not thousands of black Americans had their legal freedom stolen from them and found themselves sold into slavery on the reverse Underground Railroad. Most people, I think, know a good deal about the Underground Railroad. Historians have spent now, what, 150 years or so studying the strategies and the tactics that Harriet Tubman and her fellow conductors and station agents used to help freedom seekers escape from slavery. Their achievements are finally starting to command major attention um, in popular culture, and that is a wonderful thing. There are now walking tours about the Underground Railroad, television shows, uh, museums, including a big one in Cincinnati, you can see on the screen. And there's, of course, this new movie, uh, Harriet, which came out in 2019. All of them dedicated to uh, telling the stories of the men and women who created the secret network through which the enslaved could escape to freedom, the Underground Railroad. But we know far less, I think, about what I'm calling today the reverse Underground Railroad. Its conductors, its station agents, worked tirelessly to remain anonymous and untouchable, and the identities of all but a handful of these monsters, these criminals, still remain a mystery more than 150 years later. Uh, they never went on speaking tours about their work. They never went on fundraising tours about their work. Only rarely do their names and crimes appear in surviving police files or trial transcripts. That low profile in legal sources, the result of the decades they spent in the shadows, protected by bribes, by corruption, and by staggering amounts of contemporary indifference to the evil work they did. Unlike legal interstate slave traders who sometimes bequeathed their papers to southern colleges and historical societies in the United States, the outlaws who built the reverse Underground Railroad left no business records, no bundles of private papers for historians like me to read or to examine. They did not write memoirs, uh, they did not pose for paintings and photographs, leaving journalists and activists at the time to just guess at what they might have looked like. You can see one guess on the screen here. The warehouses and homes they used and lived in no longer stand. But, as I argue in my new book, Stolen, these professional kidnappers nonetheless left their mark everywhere on 19th century America. If we think not just about Philadelphia, where this true story is set, but about every northern town and city with a modest or significant free black population. If we think not just about 1825 when this true story is set, but about every year of the first 60 years of the 19th century, we can say with some depressing confidence that these criminals, these monsters, these traffickers stole away tens of thousands of free black people, many of them children like Cornelius who were under the age of 16. Most of those they kidnapped could not read or write and were never heard from again. Their families and friends searched, advertised, petitioned, they waited in earnest for news, but usually no news came. Free black people in northern cities like Philadelphia had very few white allies at this period in American history beyond the meager ranks of a few Quaker-led anti-slavery societies. What's more, white employers openly discriminated against African-American job applicants, while city constables in places like Philadelphia generally ignored people of color's complaints and generally turned a blind eye to most white-on-black street violence. So when children like Cornelius went missing, their parents could hardly ever persuade mayors or magistrates to get involved, to do something. It was rarer still for anyone to be able to gather enough evidence to issue arrest warrants, to search property, to interrogate suspects. And even then, experienced members of these many different kidnapping crews knew exactly what to do and what to say, uh, 
to talk their way out of trouble and to get back to work. I'm hoping a lot of the folks out there uh, that I'm speaking to uh, today have heard of 12 Years a Slave. 12 Years a Slave is the name of a memoir written by a man called Solomon Northup, who was, of course, a victim of this reverse underground railroad, but who later escaped southern slavery, which is highly unusual, returned home and wrote about it. Again, very, very unusual. And in that memoir, Twelve Years a Slave, written in 1853, Northup explains what riding the reverse Underground Railroad was like for him. He explains how a pair of well-dressed white confidence men lured him uh, into New York City from his home in upstate New York in 1841. And it's important that you know that when he was um, uh, made to ride the reverse Underground Railroad, Northup was um, literate, prosperous, employed as a musician, and uh, he was in his mid-thirties. And in Manhattan, these two well-dressed white confidence men wined him, dined him, and drugged him. And the next thing he knew, he'd been sold as a slave to an interstate slave trader in Washington, D.C., not too far from where I live today. Northrop was forced onto a slave ship that was bound for New Orleans, and in New Orleans he was sold in one of that city's infamous slave markets to a planter who then put him to work in the sugarcane fields. In 2013, an Oscar-winning film based on Northup's extraordinary autobiography drew overdue attention to his ordeal. But both the memoir and the movie offer, I think, distorted or misleading or certainly partial views of who the agents of the reverse Underground Railroad typically were, who they usually targeted, and how they normally made their money. Because it turns out that Northup's experience was not at all typical of everyone else's. Most kidnappings were committed not by smartly dressed confidence men, but by people from much poorer backgrounds who'd never set foot in a fancy bar or restaurant, who'd never wined or dined anybody. More importantly for our purposes, though, these kidnappers rarely approached highly literate, middle-aged men like Northup. They preferred instead to lure away poorly educated street kids with ruses that could swiftly separate them from their families. Very few of these captives would travel by ship to New Orleans either. Instead, kidnappers forced most boys and girls to trek southward on foot in small specialized overland convoys known as coffles, after the Arabic word for caravan. Their prisoners rarely ended up in showrooms or on the auction block either. Their captives, these children like Cornelius, were vastly more likely to be sold off in ones or twos along the way, in the interior of Alabama or the interior of Mississippi. In furtive, all-cash deals to hard-up planters who wanted to buy more human beings, but who were too cheap to afford big city New Orleans slave prices. And all of that was almost exactly what did happen to Cornelius Sinclair, the ten-year-old boy who's one of five central figures in my book. In August of 1825, Cornelius and four other boys living in Philadelphia, and their names were Sam, Enos, Alex, and Joe. These five black children fell into the hands of 19th century America's most fearsome gang of kidnappers. Their captors hustled them onto a ship just outside Philadelphia, which you can see in the top right of this screen. Their kidnappers warehoused them for a while in a pair of safe houses on Delmarva, the peninsula just south of Pennsylvania that's home to most of Delaware and to slivers of Maryland and Virginia. And then their kidnappers marched them on, halfway across this vast North American continent of ours, towards the Deep South, where they tried to sell these five free children as slaves. I'm not going to say much more today about this soul-destroying journey. 
And I'm also going to be a bit coy, perhaps, about the how and why of the astonishing odyssey back to Philadelphia that my book title refers to, which is to say I'm not keen to give away everything that happens in the second half of the book when some miraculous, extraordinary, and I think wonderful things happen that allow some, but not all, of these boys to return home. All I will say here is that what did happen next to Cornelius Sinclair and to the four other boys who met for the first time in the belly of that ship was indeed astonishing. It was astonishing to them, and it's astonishing to me. It would involve two murders, three exhumations of dead bodies, an escape, a recapture, a suicide, a race riot, a lawsuit, America's first most wanted list, and the largest manhunt in the United States so far. Instead, let me just quickly note that the full story of what did happen next to Cornelius Sinclair and the four other boys who went missing from Philadelphia in August 1825 is a story that's never before been fully told. And that's for understandable reasons. Because Cornelius was a child at the time he went missing. He came from a hard-up family that was not the sort to leave behind many traces in archives and in libraries. And that's a problem, right? Because historians like me, we need sources. We need lots of sources to reconstruct past lives in ways that are true and ways that are fair. This is not fiction. This is a true story. And the stories and struggles of the many people who do not leave behind rich troves of papers, diaries, or letters often remain untold and unstudied because historians sometimes lack the sources. To reconstruct the outline of Cornelius's journey along this reverse underground railroad, I began by ringing what I could from a small packet of letters written to or from the mayor of Philadelphia. You can see him on the screen here. And from coverage of Cornelius's case in a single Philadelphia anti-slavery magazine. To be clear, historians have known about these modest sources for some time, but they turn out to be too few and too thin to sustain a whole book about this complicated case. So I began with those sources, but then I had to go digging elsewhere, looking around in any archive I could find for scraps of new information that when put together could help me reconstruct this complicated case. There has been what felt like a lot of failure along the way, a lot of days in archives far from home spent uh, looking for needles in haystacks and finding a lot of hay. Um, but eventually you start to find those needles, right? And ultimately I think it's definitely been worth it. Over six years of research for this book, I have unearthed more than a hundred new sources about this case, buried within 35 different archives in 14 different states and in the District of Columbia. And I'm not going to list all 100 of them now, you'll be pleased to learn, but I'll just mention three real quick to give you a flavor of what I've been able to find. Um, among my discoveries was the handwritten notes of a trial that took place in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which would decide the fate of one of these five children, the fate of Cornelius, for the rest of his natural life. Would he be forever free or forever slave? A jury of Alabamians got to decide. I also found something I thought I never thought I'd find. A pair of letters in which one of the kidnappers explained how the gang did its work and then lied through his teeth about his own role and pleaded his innocence. And the third source I want to mention briefly is a source I found pretty early in the research process, but a source that has stuck with me or affected me perhaps more than any other that I've come across. Um, it's a missing persons notice uh, placed in a Philadelphia paper three days after Cornelius disappears by his father. Um, it's short, so I'm going to uh, read it uh, to you. Boy Lost, the subscriber's son, Cornelius Sinclair, a colored boy about 11 years old, left his friends yesterday, and as he had no cause 
and had never before presented himself, it is feared he has been seduced away by some evil-minded person. My son is a very dark-skinned lad. He's pretty stout-built. He's got thin, long fingers. His eyes are weak. His left eye is stronger, is smaller, excuse me, than his right. Any person hearing of my son will confer a favor on his afflicted parents by giving information to my employer at this address. Every time I read this uh, missing persons ad, um, two words out of what, 100, 150 here, uh, jump out at me more so than all the others. They look like they're written uh, 60 foot high in neon. Afflicted parents. For African Americans struggling with the disappearance, the kidnapping, the abduction of their children, affliction seems like the understatement of the 19th century. Before I seek your uh, questions, and I've got two questions from staff members at Octopus that I'm going to try and tackle, let me wrap up with a couple of reflections about why I think learning about America's reverse Underground Railroad is important, and why studying Cornelius Sinclair's particular experience as a forced rider on the reverse Underground Railroad is worth your time. To begin with, I would argue forcefully that then as today, Families belong together, and black lives matter, and that any story about free children being ripped from their families and swallowed up, in this case by slavery, is a story worth telling for its own sake. But the remarkable ordeal that Cornelius and his four fellow captives endured also demands our attention for many other reasons. For one thing, it serves as a pointed reminder that child snatching was heartbreakingly frequent in the decades before the American Civil War, and that black freedom in northern towns and cities was achingly fragile. It demonstrates, too, the important role that this grotesque trade in kidnapped free people played in accelerating the spread of American slavery into the Deep South over this period. Now, as I said, I'm not going to preview the book's uh, ending, which is much brighter than its beginning. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what happened to Cornelius after he was kidnapped and trafficked into Alabama, but I will drop a few big hints uh, here. And I will say here that the dogged efforts of all those involved in trying to rescue him and the four other boys who were um, kidnapped uh, would have profound consequences. The rescue efforts of parents and allies and the aftermath of that campaign would radicalize black communities across the free states, emboldening African Americans to embrace violence in the cause of self-defense and mutual protection, as almost never before in American history. Their efforts would reshape the rest of the American anti-slavery movement as well, by encouraging white abolitionists like the, um, the guy who wrote this children's anti-slavery alphabet to try to focus the American reading public's attention on the suffering of black families forcibly separated by kidnapping, by slave trading, by slavery itself. But most immediately, outrage over the abduction of these five boys would force lawmakers in Pennsylvania to pass a tough new anti-kidnapping measure. This 1826 personal liberty law would enrage southern slaveholders unlike any state law passed in the North before the Civil War. This 1826 anti-kidnapping law, personal liberty law, call it what you want, set in motion a chain of court challenges to it by pro-slavery forces, a chain of political retaliations against it, by pro-slavery forces that culminated in the passage through the American Congress of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, a pro-slavery abomination of a law that set this country on a collision course with civil war. Cornelius Sinclair's experience as a rider on this reverse Underground Railroad was the result of the confluence of massive economic and political forces. And what happened to Cornelius 
and the things that he and the other boys made happen next would, as I've just suggested, usher in a new chapter in the history of slavery and freedom in the United States. But that lasting legacy should not be allowed to obscure the urgent and human stakes of this particular small story. A ten-year-old boy and four other free children were dragged into slavery in 1825. They would have to fight like hell to try to escape. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to turn now to two questions uh, that staff members at Octopus uh, came up with. Um, uh, so question number one from the Octopus staff, let me read it to you, uh, says this. It says, uh, your book highlights the fragility of black freedom in the antebellum north, particularly due to the ever-present threat of kidnapping. Can you delve into the black community's response to this threat, the actions they took to counter it, and ensure greater protections for themselves and their children? So that's a really important question, and in the book, Stolen, I have a lot to say about the response of the black community to this case and to cases like it, because as you can imagine, um, no member of the free black community uh, consented to these um, uh, raids, and members of the black community were, of course, outraged and grief-stricken uh, by these constant um, predations uh, on themselves and on their children. And they took every possible step um, to deter, prevent, and push back um, against it. In this particular case, the case of these five um, kidnapped children, their parents play major roles in the story of how some of these boys were able to rescue themselves, liberate themselves, and achieve a homecoming. Because the parents put extraordinary pressure, as best we can tell from fragmentary sources, upon um, white political leaders in Philadelphia and in the state of Pennsylvania more generally. There's a reason I showed you a picture of the mayor of Philadelphia and mentioned letters to or from him. The correspondence of the mayor um, which provides evidence of him wading into this case to help get these boys back to their parents betrays uh, repeated evidence of lobbying pressure upon him from the parents themselves and from prominent members of the free black community like black ministers. Uh, Philadelphia was full of free black churches and had a vibrant um, free black community. And they're putting extraordinary political and social and religious and moral pressure on him to act in this particular case. They're also taking matters into their own hands, of course, something I mentioned towards the conclusion of my remarks. Um, because white allies are few and far between and often unreliable, members of the free black community, um, husbands, wives, parents, children themselves, have to do what they can to protect themselves and their loved ones from the threat that these kidnappers and enslavers pose. So we see the rise within the free black community of all sorts of institutions designed to provide mutual aid. Um, we should think of black churches as being um, soup kitchens, employment agencies, um, sources of financial support, and also hiding places from all sorts of um, kidnappers, bounty hunters, slave catchers, etc. We also see the rise of what are called um, vigilance committees within free black neighborhoods, some of the first vigilance committees in the United States. And you should think of these as being the, the early equivalent of modern sort of neighborhood watch schemes that people in a community, in a neighborhood, in the street, pledge to look out for each other. That they pledge that when they see something, they will say something. They pledge that when they see someone suspicious in the street who has the quote, gallows look of a kidnapper, that they will muster their courage and go out and challenge that person and shoo him away. If they see a kidnapping in progress, they will rush from their homes with any makeshift weapons they can think of, pans, sticks, clubs, uh, and beat the living you-know-what out of this guy to get him to release the child he has in his clutches and make him slink away. And members of free black communities in cities across the United States do this again and again and again, uh, taking justice, taking deterrence, taking self-preservation and mutual protection into their own hands because they cannot rely um, 
on uh, law enforcement at this time to be an active and reliable ally. Let's take one final question from the staff at Octopus. It reads as follows. The widespread demonstrations prompted by the killing of George Floyd have led to a popular movement of recognition of the continued injustices faced by black people in North America, drawing our attention to the long enduring legacy of slavery. We were wondering if you might have any thoughts on connecting the themes of your book with present day events in the United States. There are so many resonances, unfortunately, between the terrifying world described in the first half of my book, Stolen, and the world we live in uh, now. Um, the degree to which white violence against free African Americans can go unpunished and undeterred before the Civil War and in our present day is distressing in its similarity. And the idea that the Civil War in the United States, which outlawed race slavery, also brought an end to racial injustice is clearly um, a fallacy. Um, I want to point out something slightly different here, which is to talk about the persistence of other types of slavery in our modern um, world, not just to draw parallels to um, the uh, events unfolding as we speak, but also to remind our viewers out there of the crisis at the southern border uh, as well, uh, and the separation of families um, there, and more broadly of the persistence of slavery in various forms in the way we live now. Around the world, um, about 40 million people wake up every day in some degree of slavery or other. That could be agricultural slavery, that could be domestic slavery, that could be sex slavery. Uh, and in the United States, uh, that figure is not zero. Um, even though race slavery is outlawed um, by the post-Civil War amendments uh, to the US Constitution, we know that illegal slavery continues uh, in the United States and in Canada too and in the United Kingdom, where I'm obviously from, um, we see in the United States, according to NGOs like Free the Slaves, Amnesty International and Polaris, um, numbers in the range of 30,000 or 40,000 Americans waking up every day again in agricultural slavery, domestic slavery, or um, sex slavery. So the idea that the problems of the past, whether they be deep-seated racial prejudice against African Americans, or whether they be the insidious effects of chattel bondage, slavery, remain with us uh, today. But the great lesson of stories like Stolen, and the great lesson of the American anti-slavery movement more generally, is that we can do amazing things when we combine our forces and when we work strategically. The anti-slavery movement uh, arose from uh, um, very slender beginnings uh, to topple an economic institution which was all pervasive across uh, almost um, every state of the Union at the moment of independence in 1776. By 1865, um, slavery has been declared, uh, legally speaking at least, uh, dead and buried. That's an extraordinary turnaround. Uh, for any nation of human beings in the course of, what, 88 years or so. Uh, so we have it within our own potential in Canada, in the United States, in the United Kingdom and elsewhere to do extraordinary things and to confront racial injustice with everything we have. And the lesson of the anti-slavery movement and the lessons of my new book, Stolen, I think provide grounds for cautious optimism that if we can do this once, we can do it again. Thank you very much indeed.